Hi, I am Tsumo Li from MIT CSAIL. I will talk about our recent work on differentiable vector graphics rasterization. This is a collaboration between MIT CSAIL and Adobe. Vector graphic is a compact and resolution independent mathematical representation of shapes that is commonly used in user interface, web, web design, logos, fonts, art, Google map, etc. To show a vector graphics on the display, we need to rasterize it to a raster image. Despite its popularity, there are not many previous works on editing vector graphics. Most of them focus on the geometric properties of the vector graphics, like how do we represent the parallel lines or how do we represent repetitive patterns. More recently, there are works on machine learning where people want to teach machine to draw vector graphics. This is a hot direction, but so far most methods either require vector supervision or brute force reinforcement learning. One problem is that we can't apply the powerful convolutional neural networks to vector graphics because they lack the structure of the raster images. On the other hand, raster image processing and learning has advanced a lot in the last decades. In addition to the more traditional computational photography methods like retargeting or texture synthesis, we can now learn very complex structure from raster images using convolutional neural networks. Our goal is to bridge the gap between the vector and raster graphics by connecting them using a differentiable vector graphics rasterizer. Once we have our differentiable rasterizer, we can unify editing and learning of vector graphics, propagating learn the editing and learning raster, uh, propagating the editing and learning of raster images back to the vector graphics using gradient descent update. In this talk, I will discuss, I will discuss two questions. First, how do we compute the gradients of vector graphics rasterization? Second, what can we do with our differentiable rasterizer? I'll start with the first one. To, to compute the gradients, we borrow the idea from our recent 3D differentiable rendering work. Our key observation is that anti-aliasing makes rasterization differentiable. Even though a point sample might hit or miss a shape, after anti-aliasing, the pixel filter integral changes continuously as the shape deforms. Differentiable rasterization leads to some requirements of our rasterization algorithm. Firstly, some rasterization algorithms need to convert shape formats in non-differentiable ways. We don't want to do that. Next, because we are using the differentiable rasterizer in some optimization, we want minimal approximation since the optimization process can produce arbitrary shapes. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, we need to support anti-aliasing and differentiate it. Based on these requirements, I will discuss our, uh, our, discuss, our, discuss our rasterization algorithm. I'll start from the representation. We follow the Scalable Vector Graphics Representation, or SVG, which is the standard representation of vector graphics used in practice. In SVG, we can define some closed curves or open curves, and we can fill curves with colors or draw strokes with the curves. These curves are usually defined as polynomials or rational polynomials like Bayesian curves or ellipses. They're usually defined in parametric forms, so we have a function p that maps a scalar t to 2D positions. The most popular curves are quadratic or cubic Bayesian curves, which are quadratic or cubic polynomials over t. For efficiency and convenience, many previous rasterizers would convert strokes into field shapes. Unfortunately, this process is not differentiable, because the number of segments of the field shapes depends on the stroke parameters. We do not want to do this. Instead, we will render the shapes directly without conversion. To render the shapes, we rely on the inside-outside tests, inspired by Nihop and Hopi's work at 2008. Given the point and the curve, we test if the point is inside the curve. For strokes, we need to find the distance d between the point and the curve, and if this distance d is smaller than half the stroke width w, then we are inside the stroke. For field shapes, we trace a ray from the point and see how many times we intersect the shape. If it is odd number of times, the point is inside the shape, otherwise it is outside. For computing the distance d for strokes, Nihop and Hopi relied on approximating the distance. Unfortunately, this approximation fails when the stroke width is large. This is fine for them because they assume the stroke width is small in practice. However, since we are using this as an optimi since we are using this in an optimization, we may want to have large strokes. Instead, we need to compute exact distance to curve without approximation. This operation is not very well discussed in the literature for qubit curves. To compute the exact distance between the point Q and the curve P, we want to find the closest point P of T star, such that the square of the L2 distance is minimized. So this is an 1D optimization problem. To find the minimum of this function, we take the derivative and set it to zero. For qubit curves, this becomes a fifth-order polynomial equation. 
we know that there's no closed form for a solution for the fifth order polynomial roots. So we have to rely on iterative solvers. We propose an iterative solver that will find all the roots of this fifth order polynomial by separating all the roots into regions and do Newton iteration in those regions. See the paper for details. As I mentioned earlier, we need to support anti-aliasing and differentiate through it. We provide two anti-aliasing options that have different characteristics. Our first option is based on Monte Carlo sampling, where we, discrete, where we discretize the anti-aliasing integral and into discrete sum by sampling the domain. Our second option is based on approximating shapes using the closest point to form a half space. This allows us to analytically approximate the integrals. The Monte Carlo solution is higher quality but slower, and the half space approximation is faster but can produce some artifacts. For example, one notorious artifacts of the half space approximation is something people call the conflation artifacts. If you have two shapes that overlap on part of the boundaries, you'll see something like the image on the right. Modern GPU rasterizers don't use half space approximation because of this artifact. Still, many CPU rasterizers are using it because it is fast. Unfortunately, we cannot apply automatic differentiation to either of these two options. If we apply it to the Monte Carlo sampling method, we get incorrect derivatives. If we apply it to half space approximation, we get the correct derivatives, but it will, it will use an enormous amount of memory. I will discuss why this is the case for Monte Carlo sampling first and how we deal with it. The problem with automatic differentiating Monte Carlo sampling is that the Monte Carlo samples do not really land on places where interesting events happen. Suppose we're deforming the yellow shape, all changes are happening at the boundaries, and Monte Carlo samples have a zero probability of detecting it. If you ask one of these Monte Carlo samples, they will just say the derivative is zero. So what we do is to explicitly sample the boundary to detect the change when computing the derivatives. If we ask, if we ask one of these boundary samples what is the derivatives, they will not be able to say, after the, uh, say that after the deformation, there will be more yellow and less white or red. So we can compute the derivatives. The math of the derivative, the math of the derivative can be derived from this Reynolds transform theorem. We have another presentation at Secret of Asia related to this. Check out Sai Bengaru's talk about unbiased warp area sampling for differential rendering. It's also similar to our previous 3D differential rendering work, where we handle polynomial curves instead of triangle meshes. So we resolve the in incorrect automatic differentiation of Monte Carlo sampling by sampling boundaries. Now I will explain the problem of differentiating the half space approximation. Automatically differentiating the half space approximation does give us the correct result because we simplify the integral into a differentiable expression. However, this means that we need to differentiate through the distance to curves. And for cupid curves or any curves that doesn't have a closed form distance, we need to differentiate the iterative solvers. Remember that we can turn the distance into some optimization problem where we find the roots of the derivatives. Let's call the derivative function r, and it depends on some curve parameters alpha. We want to find a t star such that the derivative function evaluates to zero, and we want to differentiate this process. If we have an iterative solver for r, and if we apply automatic differentiation to it, automatic differentiation will create a tape that records all the intermediate values so that we can backpropagate through it later. This creates a huge demand on memory because we have to do this for each pixel. We do not want this. Instead, our solution is to apply implicit function theorem. Given the implicit function like r, implicit function theorem tells, tells us directly what is the derivative between the parameters of r. We can, use, we can then use this information to backpropagate to curve parameters alpha. This works because we know, what, uh, we know we are at the root of the function, but Autodiff does not know about this. Using this approach, we don't need any tape to sort the intermediate values, so the memory usage is constant. To recap, I showed that automatic differentiating at the aliasing gives undesirable results, and we need specialized solution for correctness and efficiency. Let's review our requirements of our rasterization algorithm. We don't rely on any non-differentiable conversion because we use inside-outside tests. Furthermore, we avoid approximating distance because we, they can fail for some bad parameters. We support two different kinds of differentiable anti-aliasing. We cannot rely on automatic differentiation because they are wrong and inefficient. Instead, for Monte Carlo, we apply boundary sampling and for half space approximation, we apply implicit function theorem to avoid storing tapes. Now we have our differentiable rasterizer. We will answer the second question. What can we do with it? 
Turns out we can do quite a bit. Many of them are new vector graphics editing and learning operations. I will discuss them one by one. one, by one. One of the first thing we build using our differential brushizer is an interactive brush based editor. Given the vector graphics and the brush, we do gradient descent to increase or decrease the opacity within the brush. This allows us to sculpt our vector graphics to a desired shape. We can also combine this editor with geometric constraints, like saying we want some of the lines to be parallel, etc. We can solve these constraints using standard optimization tools like projected gradient descent or Lagrange multipliers. As a fancy example, we can also use a cigarette-shaped brush for editing. Another application we found to be useful is to refine image vectorization results. Given the raster image, we want to convert it to a vector image. There are many tools out there we can use to achieve this. For example, Adobe Illustrator has this feature called Image Trace. What we can do is to take Adobe Image Trace result and further optimize it using gradient descent. We found that we get, we get significant, significantly more accurate vectorization by doing this. Here's a video showing the optimization process. And here's an arrow map. We obtain much lower arrow both around the edges and textures. We tried it on a few images and found that on average we are better than Adobe Image Trace for about 3 to 4 decibel in terms of PSNR. Another cool application is that we can simulate what an image looks like if it is composed of many strokes. Given a target raster image, we start from some random distribution of strokes and then we optimize for the parameters. And this gives us a painterly looking because of the strokes. We can fit the strokes using different metrics. We found that L2 gives a fa more faithful look and the deep perceptual metric gives a more stylish look. We can also apply image processing operators on the raster render and propagate the change back to the vector graphics. One example of this is scene carving, which is an image processing operator that changes the aspect ratio of the image by removing, removing pixels. We take an input vector graphics when we render it, and then we apply one step of scene carving, and then we propagate the change back to the input using gradient descent, and then we repeat this process. So here's a video showing the optimization process. Finally, we also did some early experiments with deep learning. We want to take raster training data and learn the vector structure inside them. We train this vector autoencoder, so the network takes a raster training image and produces a vector graphics. We then take the produced vector graphics and render it with our differential rasterizer. We then compare the raster rendering and the input and back propagate the gradients to the network weights. In this way, we can learn a network that produces vector graphics given raster images. We can also sample from the network to generate new vector graphics by tweaking the latent variable in the network. So given the target raster images from MNIST, our network can output vector graphics like the one on the right. These vector graphics are infinite resolution compared to the target raster images. Alternatively, we can generate a generative adversarial network. So instead of taking the raster image as an input, we train a classifier to classify between the rendering and the raster training data. So here's some sample from our vector GAN generated by sampling the latent variable. These results are fine, but GANs are more difficult to train, so we don't get results as good as a variational autoencoder. Because now we can sample digits in the latent space, we can also interpolate them. If you ever wonder what the integer between 0 and 1 looks like, here is it. One major limitation of our work is that we do not have anything, we do not do anything to the vector topology. This is both a blessing and a curse. Real vector graphics has complex topological structure like the one we show on the right. We preserve this structure during the optimization, but we do not synthesize more. Maybe some language processing models like RNN or Transformer can help generating the topology. So that's it. In conclusion, we show that there are promising applications we can do with differential rasterization. Technical-wise, differential rasterization requires us to rethink vector rasterization and automatic differentiation. The code is available at our project site. Thanks.